Monday I was in Corinth. I've always wanted to begin a sermon like that. But it's true. After a weekend speaking in Athens, uh, Sean and I ambled along the ruins of ancient Corinth. Should appear on the screen. There we are. That's where we were last Monday. We ambled along the streets where once upon a time the Apostle Paul had walked. Uh, uh, here's Sean. This is a bit like, there she is. Here's Sean. Uh, just uh, in the background, the temple of Apollo and the Agora, the, the, the large public space where in the first century you'd find shops and meat markets and hairdressers and health clubs and brothels. And, and there's me, not a very good picture that one. <laughs> I'm in front of something, you can't see it very well, that the Greeks and Romans called the bema, which really means judgment seat. Next slide, it, it was the official stage where important civic matters were dealt with. It was, it was here in about AD 52 that according to the book of Acts, uh, Paul stood before the Roman proconsul Gallio. He was accused by the Jews of sedition for persuading people to worship God contrary to their law. And writing his second letter, there's an echo of that experience that Paul mentions, the bema in chapter 5. We looked at it just two or three weeks ago. It's a judgment seat far more important than any earthly court. Remember Paul's words in In chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul makes another reference to the Corinthian culture in our passage today. There it is in verse 16 of chapter 6. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Next picture. That temple of Apollo would have been encountered by Paul each time he entered the, uh, the marketplace, the Agora. That, that was one of the largest of the many shrines in Corinth, the most infamous of which was, next slide, the temple of, of Epaphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love. It was situated on the Acro-Corinth, uh, the hill high above the city where 1,000 sacred prostitutes provided worshippers a guarantee that for a price Aphrodite would hear their prayers. That was the kind of place Corinth was. In fact, Greeks called someone whose lifestyle epitomized the idolatry and immorality of the age, that they called such a person Corinthian. And into this world, Paul came with his message about Jesus, the one true God. Paul spent 18 months establishing a Christian community in in the city. It was a church that Paul loved like no other, but it was a church which gave him trouble like no other. And it's their complex relationship that Paul reflects on in the paragraphs that we read just now. It was complex, was their relationship, because after Paul had left Corinth, the church was infiltrated by a pressure group who didn't think much of him or his message. Neither had power or success as far as these critics were concerned. And in Paul's absence from Corinth, some of the believers there sided with Paul's opponents. And they slipped back into being Corinthian. So Paul writes, 1 Corinthians. And then he pays them a surprise visit. But it turns out to be a very difficult time. So he writes another letter. This one is very, very blunt. And although it hasn't come down to us as a living text, Paul refers to it on several occasions in our letter, 2 Corinthians. If you just look over the page to chapter 7 and verse 8, Paul refers to it. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. So that's the context, all right? 
And in our paragraphs here, we find Paul appealing to the Corinthians to back him and his gospel. And the first thing he wants to see from them is an open heart. An open heart. Have you ever been in a very one-sided relationship where you make all the running? That's what it felt like for Paul with these people. He was doing all the giving but getting nothing back in return. He widened his heart to them but they had narrowed theirs to him. So verse 11 of chapter 6, we've spoken freely to you Corinthians and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you but you are withholding your affection from us as a fair exchange. I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. Now, Paul has already spoken freely and with painful honesty to these people in his letter in the previous chapters. Just listen to Paul from a few verses before in chapter 6. And verse 4, rather as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distress, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, in sleepless nights, and hunger. You see how, how he'd opened his, his heart wide to them. This is me, says Paul. I, I am not maybe up to much, but I am God's, and I am a survivor. I think that's what an open heart looks like. That transparency and, and, and honesty. Here is a man determined not to wear a mask. Jenny referred to mask wearing in her piece just now. Here is a man quite clearly determined not to wear a mask and, prefer, and pretend that everything is okay when it clearly isn't. It's true, isn't it, that we could all be brilliant cover-up artists, Christians as well, projecting an image of success and togetherness when the reality is very different. I don't know, it's as if we want everyone to read us the way that some people write their annual family newsletter, which they slip inside the Christmas card. You know, the kind that goes to great lengths to say how well the children are doing at school, how Eustace got a distinction in grade four for clarinet, how Jemima was chosen as head girl, how Barnaby was awarded his Duke of Edinburgh prize and then they reel off Roger's promotion at work, the kitchen extension, the holiday home in Bermuda, Jane's unexpected OBE for services to the community. It just goes on and on and on, this catalogue of well-polished brilliance. Paul, Paul didn't project such a superhero Christian impression of himself. He'd come to embrace who he was. And that included his struggles, his weaknesses, his failures. He'd come to see that our human fragility is exactly the context in which we can experience the power of God. Remember how he said it in chapter 4? We have this treasure in jars of clay. There were two kinds of of pots on display in the Corinth Museum that we wandered through last Monday. There were those pots for special occasions, ornate, glazed, decorated, colorful. And then there were the ordinary terracotta pots that were two a penny from the market, disposable, easily broken and chipped. That is the word that Paul uses of himself and of all those who trust in Christ. We are just two a penny pots. But into that jar of clay has been placed the treasure of the gospel, the knowledge and experience of God through faith in Jesus. My friends, the reality for every Christian, I don't care who you are, the reality for every Christian is that we are all frail and we are all wounded people. It's just that some of us uh, seem more reluctant to admit that than others. Paul here tells these people the way it is for him. 
the upside and the downside. Listen as he completes that CV from verse 8 of the uh, the previous section. Verse 8, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Paul is telling it the way it is because that's the way that the all-surpassing power of God is seen in us. That the power is seen to be not from us, but from God. There is a massive temptation to tell only our best stories, isn't there? To show only our best side. I don't know where that comes from. Maybe from a deep insecurity which believes that people won't like us if they know what we're really like. Or that we might be letting the Christian side down if we admit the difficulties and vulnerability. You see, I think our problem is that by nature we seek and value the praise of other people too much. What others think of us matters too much. We are glory hunters. And that goes for for Christian pastors too, Christian leaders too. We we all want as Christian leaders to be able to attend a, a conference and tell all the delegates how well things are going in our church. We long to be able to say, well, when we began our latest church plant, there were only three old ladies and a three-legged dog. Now there are 3,000 young, gifted, lively men and women, 300 signed up for an inquirer's course, 30 on the church staff, and a budget of 1.3 million. And we only began three weeks ago. That's the kind of thing you want to say. Why? What drives us to that sort of over-dependence on the approval of others. Is God not enough for us? Is our identity too wrapped up in the idols of our culture? You see, this, this constant, constant pressure to construct an image of success produces, in the end, an impossibly heavy burden to carry. We have to project something that we are not. And we become fake in the process. True Christian character comes from the capacity to open our hearts both to the trials and the triumphs of life. Christian character comes from understanding that the power is not from us but from God. For Paul's appeal here is not actually that these Christians would approve and love him so much as that they will love his savior and the gospel. This message about a crucified savior. Paul wants these people to open their hearts to embrace the way of the cross. Well, that is what a a disciple of Jesus signs up to. Hard yards, tough times, blood, sweat, tears, and wounds. You see, we are to tell that story with all its shadows so that people can understand their own shadow. Because what people need, really need, are examples of those who are, as believers, trying to figure out how to follow Christ in the joy and wreckage of life. So a Christianity that is real and not fake must begin at the ragged edges of our own pain. And to share that story, to say, this is me, it involves risk. And Paul is taking that risk with this church here. He is wearing, as we say, his heart on his sleeve. Even if that means rejection, he was going to love them, whatever the cost. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian apologist of the 20th century, reflects on the 
on the issue of, of, of the nature of love in, 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 in this way. There is no safe investment, he says. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If, if you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your own selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. So my friends, if we aspire to, to authentic relationships as a Christian, if we aspire as a church to be a real Christian community and not one that wears masks, it will never happen if we won't take the risks which love requires. And for that, we need hearts that are wide open. But also, we need an undivided heart. That is the second thing that Paul seems to want from these people and for them. Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, if you were in the first century congregation at Corinth reading that from Paul and you were from a Jewish background, you would have understood what Paul was going on about. For, for the Old Testament law discouraged plowing a field with two different animals, an ox or a donkey. There were other similar warnings, not to make a garment from, from two different fibers, not to sow two different crops in the same field. That wasn't just good farming practice or good fashion sense. The bigger point being made by the Mosaic law was that God is holy and pure, unmixed. And that therefore his people were to reflect his character. They were not to get mixed up with the belief systems of their pagan neighbors. Their hearts were, were to belong to God alone. How did the psalmist put it? Teach me your way, O Lord. Give me an undivided heart. It's there on the screen. That I may fear your name. An undivided heart. This need for an undivided heart is the reason that Paul, in our passage, quotes the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel there, verse 17. Therefore, in quotes they are from, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I'll receive you. I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The people of God then were in exile in Babylon. And the prophets were saying, be distinctive from the society in which you're living and, and working. In exile, belong to God, have an undivided heart. So Paul applies all of that to the people of God in the church at Corinth in the first century. Don't yoke your faith in Jesus to idols. Don't pick and mix what you believe. Keep your heart single-mindedly devoted to God. And in the verses, he offers several reasons for that. Number one, all such alliances are incompatible. Read on in verse 14. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? That's an ancient Hebrew word for the devil. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. 
What do these things have in common? Well, they don't. They're incompatible. It doesn't make any sense. And the second reason Paul suggests from those verses is that such partnerships, such associations, undermine the nature of the church in which God lives by his spirit. For we are the temple of God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. So you see, Paul is saying to these Christians, do you want to know the promise of God's presence in your church community? Do you want to know the blessing of being in God's family? Then stop flirting with the gods and values of your neighbors. Cut out the compromise. Do you remember how Jesus says something very similar? He says, look, you've got a choice. It's God or mammon. You can't mix the two. It's treasure in heaven or on earth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So don't try and live, says Jesus, with a a divided heart. It's just not possible. The human heart is capable of only one center of affection, only one true object of worship. So what's it going to be, says Jesus? God or mammon, the Greek word for materialism, the God of the age. Now, come back and think with me, therefore, about what is the danger that Paul is identifying here in Corinth. I think it's this. It is Christians losing their distinctiveness slipping back into their former pagan culture of idolatry. After all, if you wanted to make it in Corinth, if you wanted to get on in life, if you wanted to make a success of your career, then then you had to visit the temples of Corinth. That was the place to be seen because there were the dining clubs of the city. The guilds were there connected to the temple associated with a god or goddess and it was there that if you wanted to get promotion in work you did your networking if you were a business person and wanted to land a deal then that's where you went to make your deals and your corinthian neighbors were bound to have in their home a little shrine in honor of their household personal gods so if you were invited around to lunch the chances were that the roast dinner was meat that had been previously offered uh, before an idol in the temple. Okay, so, if that was then, what about now? What does it mean for us today when Paul says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers? Now listen, if we were in an African or Asian context, It would perhaps be more obvious. Don't practice the occult or witchcraft. Don't go to the shaman. Don't worship idols or the ancestral gods. But what do such verses like this mean to people like us in the West? Well, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the Christian is to isolate himself or herself from all contact with non-Christians. It doesn't mean that we are to do business only with Christians. Actually, some Christians are the last people on earth you want to do business with. It, it, It doesn't mean that we are only to work with Christians, to have only Christian friends, to send our children only to Christian schools. In other words, this is not a call to separation and cultural disengagement. Got it? We are not being asked to live in the bubble of a Christian ghetto, going only to Christian activities and singing only Christian music. Now, now over the years, many churches and, and pastors like me have wrongly used verses like this to ban Christians from, I don't know, alcohol, 
pubs, cinemas, dance halls, jazz, jeans, and jokes. Out for the Christian. Listen to the advice that Paul had already given to these believers in his first letter, chapter 5 and and, and verse 9 of of 1 Corinthians. It's very striking. Chapter 5 and and, and verse 9 of 1 Corinthians. I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, all the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. Paul is not arguing there or here for Christians to retreat from society and to live their lives in a hermetically sealed environment. So so what does it mean? Don't lose your edge as a Christian. Don't allow your message about Jesus to be diluted by the world. Don't allow your life to be compromised. Let me kind of nail this a little bit. Be wise in who you go out with and marry. Make sure they love the Lord Jesus above everything. Be radical in your commitment Be who you are in Christ. Be different. Be distinctively Christian in your values and lifestyle choices. Be in the world, yes. But don't be like the world. We need to be radical as believers without being weird. Some of us are just simply weird. We're not that radical, we're just weird. Real Christianity challenges the culture. It doesn't endorse the culture. You see, there are forms of Christianity in our contemporary society which, in my view, simply dress the world's values up in Christian clothes. I mean, I would suggest that the health and wealth prosperity gospel is pretty much that. It is simply an echo of the world and its idolatry. It gives a thumbs up to the idols of the day. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your bank balance. I think sometimes in a, in a genuine attempt to make the church more accessible to the culture in which we live, actually, although it's a genuine attempt, we, we end up making the gospel more irrelevant. I mean, were you aware in the summer of what the cathedrals in Norwich and Rochester did? The nave of Norwich Cathedral was turned into a fairground ride and the central aisle of Rochester Cathedral became a crazy golf course. Now, I'm not doubting the motives of the deans or canons of those cathedrals. I, I, I'm just not convinced that churches are going to make lots of committed disciples of Jesus as a result of having a fairground ride in your nave or a crazy golf course down your central aisle. Folks, what society needs is not churches and Christians trying to be embarrassingly trendy but radically different that's what the society in which we operate needs not for us to try to be trendy but for us to try and live the truth of the gospel in a radical way which means that in our contemporary context, we challenge the status quo. We don't reinforce it. Just because the Telegraph or the Guardian or the BBC say it doesn't mean we have to. We we are not to mix our message so that we end up (laughs) repeating precisely what society does about, for example, the sanctity of the life of the unborn. We're not simply to be an echo of what the prevailing moral 
culture says. We're not simply to repeat what the world says about human sexuality or gender identity. We are to think differently and biblically and Christianly. So we need to be Christians with an open heart, but also an undivided heart. And finally, and briefly, we need to be believers and churches with a renewed heart. Because that's passionately what Paul wants to see in the section that runs from chapter 7, verse 2, to the end of our reading, verse 16. Paul wants the heartbeat of these Christians to be a renewed and restored heart towards God and towards him. So he he comes back in, in this last section to that complex relationship between them. See verse two of chapter seven? He's at it again. Make room in your hearts for us. Open up to us. He, he, he reveals in verse three just how much his life is bound up in theirs. Listen to this, verse three. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. If, if they are doing okay, no matter his troubles, he's okay. You know, every Christian leader or pastor who is serious about the task of Christian ministry will be impacted, affected by what's going on in the congregation. Of course they will be. They live or die, says Paul. And and he explores his own state of mind from verse 5. He recounts there how he waited anxiously for news about them. There was this strain in their relationship. So had they responded positively to that severe letter he'd written to them? Were they backing his leadership? Verse 5, when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you'd given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever their hearts had been renewed what a relief Titus his companion in mission had turned up he was on his own and shared with Paul the good news things had been turned around in Corinth God had restored renewed the hearts of the people there and the key indicator of that renewed heart is is is, is the nature of their repentance. For you became sorrowful, verse 9, as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. There is a big difference, is there not, between feeling sorry and being repentant? Not all sorrow, Paul says, leads to positive outcomes, to salvation. Some sorrow leads to a self-destructive spiral of self-harm, but not godly sorrow. That produces what? Energy. Verse 11, see what this godly... Sorrow has produced in you what earnestness, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what what concern, what readiness to see justice done. Godly sorrow, true renewal of the heart, wants to put things right. It wants to sort things out. It wants to get things done. You remember how in the gospel, Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus, the tax collector's house, and Zacchaeus came down from the tree, 
and said, Lord, I, I, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. I reckon there would have been a very long queue outside the house of Zacchaeus that day. But it's the words of Jesus to him that are significant. Zacchaeus, today, salvation has come to this house. Real repentance. Because you're going to put things right. You're going to make things right. That's what godly sorrow does. It makes amends. It acts. Godly sorrow is not just an emotional experience at a Christian meeting. It has practical consequences. So, if a businessman turns to Christ, his dubious dealings have to stop. If a guy who is sleeping with his girlfriend becomes a Christian things will have to change. For the goal of the gospel is to restore our heart to God. That's why godly sorrow is aimed first towards heaven. It's the cry of the prodigal son coming back to the father with the words, I have sinned against heaven and against you. You see, modern, modern therapy theories, the, the, the ultimate response of secular therapy, secular psychiatry, to the honest confession of sin and guilt is that the prodigal needs to forgive himself or herself. But though we long to do that, that is the one thing that we cannot do. So we need to hear those words from another, from God. For only God can say, your sins are forgiven you. That is why only godly sorrow can ever issue in hope or truly renew the heart. For what we discover in the cross where Jesus died is that there is something bigger than our sin. There is something bigger than our guilt that God forgives and reconciles us. And those who have been reconciled to God will want to be reconciled to others. That's what Paul wanted in his relationship with these Christians in Corinth. So, will we open our hearts and be vulnerable and be real? Will we keep our hearts undivided? And will we renew our hearts by real repentance? as an individual and as a community. Let's pray. Father, by your spirit, take your word and bring it home to us. Help us to tear down the masks and be real with you and real with each other. Help us to run from projecting the image of the coping Christian and embrace our frailty, knowing that at that point your power breaks through as we experience you in new ways. And Lord, may we be real as a church family, open, our hearts wide open to each other. And Lord, help us to be committed to you with that undivided heart. Help us to, to experience this morning, if we need to, godly sorrow that acts, that responds, that puts things right. For we've been reconciled to you through Jesus at the cross. You say over us, your sins are forgiven. Lord, may we therefore live as reconciled people in relation to others. And may the church family of Lansdowne be authentic because we're experiencing often the true 
reality of God's grace to us that is bigger than our sin, bigger than our guilt, that opens our hearts to each other and renews us in love for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing as we close. Lord of the church, we pray for our renewing. There may be things that you need to pray about this morning, stuff that you need to share with someone. Well, you can do that as you are, as you leave for, for tea and coffee and uh, greet those coming in. But if you particularly want prayer, 
uh, and, and help this morning, then come to the prayer point. Um, people will be glad to sit with you and talk with you and, and pray for you. Let's pray for each other now that we will be this kind of church family going forward by God's grace and through the help of his Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon us, the renewing of our hearts, the opening of our hearts to each other in love, the commitment to each other and to the faith that we hold with that undivided heart. Lord Jesus, we pray your spirit's power into our experience of frailty and vulnerability, that the power might be seen to be of you, not of us. Amen.